finally, theory number four, an inventory search. If I have uh, reason to arrest somebody and they're in their car or with their car, there are sometimes police department policies that say if you're going to arrest somebody, let's say for driving with a suspended license, uh, and you, you say, I'm going to take you down to the station, but your car is here on the highway. We need to take it in. Uh, and when we do that, we, uh, some departments say we're going to inventory the contents of the car. We'll f just take a look at what's in the trunk and we'll take it out and we'll write it all down to keep track of, of what's in there. And that way we will, pr we will protect ourselves, the police department, from any later claims that we stole something or destroyed something. You know, we'll just keep a, a list here to help us keep better track of the proper, this property of yours that we are impounding, that we are holding until you can get released and can come reclaim your, uh, your property. So that's an inventory search, and under federal law, that's okay as long as you have some kind of legitimate grounds for the impoundment. It's, uh, you're not just picking somebody out, somebody out and saying, hey, you, we're going to impound your vehicle. You have to have a proper basis for an impoundment, like, hey, you were driving without a license. You were driving with a suspended license. And if you can show that the purpose of the impoundment is not law enforcement, I'm not looking for evidence, I'm just looking to preserve your property. Maybe I'll stumble across evidence, but that wasn't my primary purpose. And then third, and this is probably most important, there's got to be some kind of standardized policy that the officer is following. They can't just make it up as they go along, but they have to be following a standardized policy, not necessarily written, but it has to be articulated and uniformly followed, or at least reasonably uniformly followed for it to count. But if you've got that kind of situation, the officer properly impounds, is not principally looking for evidence, they're just looking to preserve property, and then they're following a uh, standardized procedure for impounding and creating an inventory of the property, then, you can, then the police can look through the car to collect the stuff in the car and to write it all down in an inventory. And if you happen to find evidence of a crime, then, uh, then that was an appropriate uh, search. So those are our four theories. And let's just step back from this a minute. This is a big deal because cars, this is the place where the police interact most often with citizens. We have these surveys nationally of citizens. You know, when did you last encounter a police officer? What was the setting? How did it go? We ask this question of a big group of people every year. There's an annual survey. And we know that over half of the police citizen contacts in this country every year happen with the person in the car. You know, this is a high volume uh, encounter. This happens all the time. Uh, it's also a fairly recent you know, phenomenon. You know, we didn't have this going on in the 1880s or the 1900s or not so much in the 1920s. It's become over time more and more the common encounter. So this is high volume law, fairly recently uh, developed law, and law that's not really anchored by history because we don't have comparable uh, you know, factual settings for the older case law. So in this setting, the, uh, the law has turned out to be very prolific. Lots of analogies to older cases like Terry or Chamel, the search incident to arrest case. Uh, and in this setting, the, the law has given the government lots of different theories and the outcomes are overwhelmingly uh, pro-government in this car search setting. So if you're predicting what's likely to happen, if there's a car involved, Best rule of thumb, best bet, government's probably going to win this one. We'll talk later. Just a few minutes
think we end up with much better outcomes, which means we build trust. So uh, transparency builds trust. And so there's a, there's a big difference between videotaping and inserting yourself and interfering. And that's why our policy is clear. It's succinct. It's nobody should, should uh, really be confused by reading this policy. And so anybody that wants to know whether it's a policy violation, I think when you look at the video and you read the policy, you can pretty quickly draw your own conclusions, but we'll, we'll let the investigation take its course. Has any disciplinary action been taken against the officers, any kind of administrative duty leave, or are they still on the streets? Uh, I can tell you that uh, one of the uh, officers is uh, uh, not on patrol as of uh, this weekend. He's been uh, pulled from patrol. Uh, because when you look at the attitude in terms of not really being concerned about policy and dismissive of policy, we will not tolerate our officers being dismissive of policy. You know, policy is an absolute protective layer mm -hmm. that if you're a police officer and you're diligent in terms of your profession, you learn policy and you wrap yourself around with policy, it really is a shield. It's there to protect the police officers. It's there to protect the departments, there to protect the taxpayer. And ultimately it's there to protect the community that we serve. And when someone uh, shows a dismissive attitude in, in regards to policy, we were probably gonna be taking a pretty harsh look at that individual and a, and a pretty, pretty deep dive into their mindset and to their attitude and into the behavior that was exhibited.